is on uh, the phone with us. He has joined us now, and this person is now again approaching the intersection. You see that the people, they see it. We're going to get Bruce Thomas here in a minute. He's not here with us yet. Uh, but that was about as aggressive in a move that we've seen. One time uh, passing on the right in the right turn lane, that caused a near collision. Now you see some aggressive lane changes and actually going through an intersection there when others were sitting still. So now we're starting to see a little bit more in the way of aggressive driving uh, by this person and see now you're seeing an approach by officers quickly up on the just kind of the left rear of this person. So now they're moving in to the right trying to pass another group on the right there again using the right turn lane to get around here. We'll see if they try to continue on or actually make a right turn. So now an aggressive move through the intersection. You see one person yielding right of way, which is a smart move. But now you're starting to get into some traffic and this driver is really doing the serpentine maneuver, trying to get in and out of traffic. Bruce Thomas is now with us and uh, Bruce. How do you approach this from law enforcement when the driver begins to change behavior, starts to act a little more aggressively? Well, you know, Philip, there's a couple of things to go on with this. We have a murder suspect in the vehicle. We don't know if he is controlling the driver and telling the driver to do. Is it an ally or is it a foe? So those are some big questions to deal with right away. And, and, you know, when it comes to a carjacking, that you might be willing to pull your pursuit back just a little bit, yes? I, okay, well, look, look uh, you might not, you're going to have a bit of a delay, Bruce. Now we've gotten into oncoming traffic, and he's on the rim. So we did see some smoke earlier. We thought maybe the driver had hit a spike strip. And so now that he's going the other direction, we can see that. So this vehicle is going to be uh, not controllable. There's uh, no rubber on that front tire that we can see. You're, you also have LAPD Southeast Division in pursuit here. But for a moment there, the driver was into oncoming traffic, now back into the correct lanes here. Uh, but, Bruce, we have a vehicle that uh, is going to be Difficult to control for the driver if he chooses to go any faster. We've lost him a little bit behind the building there. But again, that was some uh, aggressive action in that he tried to drive into oncoming traffic. But so even if you stop him, Bruce, uh, even if you stop the person, because we don't necessarily know the relationship between the driver and the murder suspect, that creates a lot of unknowns for the officers. That's correct. There are a lot of unknowns about this. One is the vehicle going to become disabled, which it seems like it might. However, you are talking about a pickup truck with some weight and tonnage behind it, and it will ride on the rims that we've seen in numerous pursuits. So ultimately, when they get this vehicle stopped, um, it's going to be a high-risk traffic stop. You do have a murder suspect. They're not going to give up on this pursuit. Well, when you look at a car like that, how long until that, that – I mean – We've watched vehicles try to drive for a long time, but that, that front end starts to get really hot. Uh, that, that wheel that's running uh, metal to ground, that just doesn't last very long, right? I mean, you're, you're running at risk at fire for the vehicle too, yes? Yeah, that's correct, because most vehicles have braking systems in the front. And so when it gets hot enough, it's going to seize up which will cause it to basically just stop running and you're grinding down the rim to the actual part of the wheel well. And we've seen the vehicles get on fire. So this vehicle will end, will pursue, will end with this vehicle being disabled very shortly. Okay, we have a difficult time now. Again, so much of what's happening with our coverage here is due to LAX. We are near at least when it comes to flight paths and uh, travel, we're near LAX, so it's difficult to stay right on top of this chase. Now, it does seem we can't see them. Now, that doesn't mean law enforcement, as Bruce mentioned, is uh, backing off of this. It's just that we can't see them right now because uh, with that disabled front wheel, so it was... Uh, the right, there we go, under the bridge. We can follow, if we follow police, we can probably follow the suspect. And there he is again, Bruce. So, um, but again, he's got rubber on the, the driver's side, but he is incapable of really holding that thing steady. And you're not going to get a lot of turns. Isn't that the most difficult thing? Uh, when you have no rubber, the, he, there's no right turn, left turn. You can still go straight, but it, and that's suspect. But the difficulty is any kind of movement side to side. That's correct. I mean, because the wheel is going to seize up and lock 
in a straight position. If he turns and it locks up and seizes, now you've got a wheel that's turned and you're going to be grinding that down very quickly. But what you're going to see law enforcement, what they're doing is they're already on the radio talking under mutual aid to agencies in the South Bay saying, hey, we're coming towards you. We may need your assistance on this, including airship, uh, L.A. County's airship. Um, and ultimately, they probably have their SWAT team already on standby just for the terminus of this pursuit. Yeah, I was going to ask about SWAT team because as it, we've now passed 104th Street there, as this slows down uh, and as you are a little bit more deliberate in direction with this suspect, who again is a murder suspect, um, do your SWAT officers have an opportunity, yes, to, to get in front of this a little bit and start ha being maybe in a better position uh, to respond very quickly as opposed to a high-speed chase? Well, here we go, driving through an intersection with only one front tire with rubber. Uh, the, the rims are starting to show some damage there on that passenger front side as well. But you, again, back to the SWAT part, they're going to be in that area now, right, and, and much more uh, able to respond very quickly when this ends. Yeah, they're, they're getting all their assets in place. K-9 units, CNT team, crisis negotiating team, and SWAT team, including the Bearcat vehicle, they're all probably being spun up at this point and being sent in that direction just in the odd chance that they are needed. And with a murder suspect, you know, hopefully we always hope for the best, but you have to have plan B that he's not going to surrender peacefully and quietly. Okay, well, right now the suspect in the wrong lane driving into oncoming traffic, if anybody was coming that way, and he's now turned on to, it looks as if that might be Buckthorn, if I'm reading Air 7, uh, our SkyMap 7 correctly. Um, but again, a very deliberate turn, uh, but not showing any signs of surrender, and now continuing the drive here uh, through, through it, it's in the South Bay area. Uh, we were at... Um, Westchester. We also were in Inglewood at one point, um, and this person, there, they are at where? LAX, did you say? We were listening to our producer. They're, yes, the, they continue to remain near LAX. And Bruce, that's that's behavior that is somewhat typical in that most chases will correct generally stay around the same space, familiar yeah, for the driver. They, yeah, Phil. They seem to have a a pattern, even though it's not a pattern, of in a certain in geographic area that they may be a little more familiar with than just driving aimlessly. Um, you know, the police have run the registration on this truck uh, to figure out where he or she lives, uh, at least the registration address of the vehicle, and they're going to go to that residence also. And, um, Bruce, you know, if this is a murder suspect and there is the possibility, some reports out there that this person is armed with a rifle, um, that would eliminate the possibility of a pit maneuver in a traditional manner, yes? Because, I mean, you can't, you've got to be careful, you've got to make sure the officers are not at risk, surrounding public not at risk and something like that. What would the procedures be if they knew this person had a, had a weapon? Well, there are a couple of points that you bring into play here, Philip. One, if you do a pit maneuver and the driver is not an ally and he is just a hostage, now you've endangered their life. Also, with the pit maneuver, you've spun the vehicle out of control and it hopefully will come to a stop. Now you have an armed suspect, a high-grade felony armed suspect there, and you're putting those officers at risk. All right. Okay. So that is something that for, for viewers who might be watching, um, the, the, there are reports, there is the possibility that this suspect, murder suspect, is armed. Officers are not going to stop pursuing, as you heard from Bruce Thomas, our uh, uh, law enforcement expert. But at the same time, uh, there are a lot of variables that must be considered to protect the public um, and protect officers. So now we have another uh, U-turn possibly here. And again, that would be traditionally a place where you might try a pit, but you don't want to necessarily do that if the person driving is uh, a, a hostage, if that person has been carjacked. And Bruce, you made the, another very valid point. They've run the plates. They'll know uh, with good certainty, probably, I would guess, how the suspect might be related to the driver if they are, correct? That's correct. They're getting as much intelligence as okay, they we've can got 
on that vehicle. Okay, we're we're now we're we're it's it's almost as if this driver is probing and trying to figure out where they might go. Driving into oncoming traffic again now, uh, and again seems to be on La Cienega Boulevard and it's near freeway exits. This person is likely not going to get back on the freeway. I can't imagine without having uh, any rubber on that front right tire. We do know that this person uh, ran into uh, somebody near uh, National when they were driving National and Imperial. We saw, uh, we said, I got a note that we didn't see it, but we did see this person uh, kind of bump somebody when he was passing on the right, uh, kind of ran into somebody who was trying to make a right turn before you right. had joined us, Bruce. So the person has a couple of incidents where they've uh, run into other people on the commute here on this chase on this pursuit, um, but right now the person just seems to be continuing to poke and prod and look for different ways to not get pinned in, to kind of to keep moving. And here we go through another intersection. That was at least with the light. Um, but the way this guy is driving, this person is driving, it's, it is really without uh, purpose. That's, this is the shot here on the right that I was speaking of. They, they ran over a uh, spike strip somewhere along the way. It also could have been, I suppose, uh, when they ran into something. Uh, maybe it wasn't a spike strip. But from the beginning of this particular monitoring of this chase, we've seen a disabled vehicle because it had that uh, damage to the front vehicle. And then that tire, uh, front right passenger tire, uh, was uh, slowly going flat and then now is completely flat. There's no rubber on the rim, and you can see here on the right some of the moves from earlier, maneuvering through intersections, uh, hitting people, making unsafe turns. We've seen driving into oncoming traffic, uh, but not necessarily at high rates of speed. Right now, high rates of speed are not really possible due to the condition of the vehicle, but there are possible reports of an armed murder suspect in the vehicle. So how police approach this vehicle and try to get this to an end is still very much in doubt because you have so much that we don't know, so much in unsafe elements. Uh, if with an armed suspect that Bruce, I'll bring you back in here. You, you don't want to get up in front of this person either. And the fact that the, the fact that they're going slower, you don't want to put officers in front of the vehicle because if there is a weapon involved, that again puts them in the possible crossfire. Correct. You have that crossfire situation, which is something you don't want. The other thing too is if this suspect is armed, you don't want to force them into taking in their side deadly force action. Mm -hmm. Whereas we'd like to just end this peacefully surrender you're not going anywhere give up hands up handcuffed we're done we really don't want to get into a shooting and that especially when you start to look at where he's driving where they're going that, that you don't want that shooting for any number of reasons and not least of which is the community as a whole you don't want anybody in that neighborhood if it is a rifle that there is uh in that vehicle there are so many Walls that those shots could go through, it could cause, you know, just collateral damage that you don't want. So as Bruce is saying, nobody wants a shooting here. Officers would love to see this end as quickly as possible. Clearly, this is going to end because that vehicle is disabled and is going to get further. So the longer this goes, the more the, you can almost see if we were on the other side from Air 7, you could probably see. I'll bet you that the the it, it is nearly a broken axle at this point because he is really listing in that right side direction. So he may have lost. We saw the hubcap uh, start to deteriorate. Uh, so the rims are going to even get further and further damage. It's just going to grind itself down. And eventually, as Bruce mentioned, you know, you could turn that wheel and then all of a sudden the entire steering mechanism is locked. Um, Bruce, I've seen the front uh, tires buckle underneath and just, you know, break off completely. So this vehicle is not going to be going for very much longer. Right. That's correct. So the other thing, too, is he seems to be hanging in the Westchester area. So they might be flooding the area with units, maybe to lay additional spike strips down. Yeah, because then if that other side goes or the back tires, if he you know, loses the back tires, then the propulsion area is going to, you know, the forward movement is, is going to be more difficult. But again, still driving with a lot of traffic in the area. And that just creates so 
many other variables that are dangerous. And again, here he is now driving, it looks like, on Century Boulevard. And again, almost all of this near the airport, which affects everyone, also affects law enforcement. Bruce, what does is, what is the law enforcement helicopter do when it comes to the airport? I mean, I know they're flying a bit lower than Air 7 generally would fly, but um, th they're not allowed to go into the flight path either, are they? That's correct. It is restricted airspace by the FAA. And so even law enforcement, as with press helicopters, are barred from entering that area uh, because of the flight operations of the airport. But what we have seen, um, we did see there are some additional units that are kind of funneling the suspect vehicle, saying you don't make a right turn because there's a police car there. So they are team maybe trying to funnel him or her, we don't know, into a certain area where they can deploy additional spike strips. It looks as if he might be heading into the arrival area of the airport. Bruce, I mean, if they're actually requesting that the terminal be closed, because I can imagine if this person is a murder suspect, if this person is armed, if this person is desperate, I can't imagine law enforcement wants him getting into one of the terminals. That's correct. They notified the LA airport police uh, they're probably on standby, uh, maybe blocking some of those streets, hopefully. But if this person were to get into the terminal of the airport, this is going to become a huge, massive operation, not only on the inconveniencing of the passengers and the TSA and other personnel there, but the fact that the safety factor has just gone way off the charts. It looked as if under the overpass, the suspect was trying to make a U-turn and heading back in the opposite direction. Now, he's under that uh, terminal entrance, it looked like to me. Uh, I cannot see, we'll just have to kind of look for law enforcement to see where they are, because that's the one good thing about this is the suspect is not able to go fast enough to be able to elude authorities. Uh, there he is there. You could almost see the, the traffic that was ready to go. There it is. Now you can see that other wheel. That's what I was talking about, Bruce. It's really started to list, and now it's actually at a 90-degree angle, almost a 90-degree angle to the direction the vehicle is wanting to go. So that's going to become a massive issue for the vehicle to continue to go forward. Uh, it is going to start to get incredibly hot and it's, quite frankly, going to be causing a lot of damage to the road as well. Now it's broken off. You saw that wheel has broken off, and that's going to make it even harder to turn, and it's going to make that vehicle even hotter as far as potentially starting a fire. And yeah, so and you're right in the heart of the LAX area, and that's just causing a huge headache for not only LAPD, but the airport police are going to get involved in this very shortly. Okay, and he is now alone in his uh, lane here, except uh, he is, is not nearly the amount of traffic and somehow has continued to be able to maneuver. It looked as if that was the remnants of a spike stripper. He caught something as he had driven over. Uh, but again, this is a murder suspect that is in, we believe, the back seat, the passenger seat, of this Chevrolet pickup truck, not driving. We have some reports. We have a belief that there might be a weapon in the vehicle. We do not know. We don't. Maybe law enforcement does. We don't know the relationship of the driver to the suspect. Uh, so we don't know how authorities might be able. They don't know if this is an ally or an adversary in the vehicle. Um, so that is going to be a very challenging part of this as far as what we can think of for police, because if they don't know, if it's a carjacking of some sort, that's going to create a very, very uh, scary situation for the driver. Uh, if it is an ally, Bruce, they would likely, if they, if they know that, oh wow, now we've had damage, look at this, the vehicle is trying to force his way through, and now we're under that overpass. People are going to try to get out of the way. You saw that vehicle just drive, that is an expression of the desperation, it seems. Okay, so now you've got somebody opening the door. That is a person opening the passenger side door. The vehicle is virtually disabled. No right wheel, but law enforcement right behind. So we are now going to see what's going to happen as the person had a car door open. Somebody is backing up here. They've bailed out, and now they're on the run. They're trying to get into another vehicle, and they have. There are two women running away from the vehicle. <coughs> 
Now we have a different pursuit. The suspect, it seems, has jumped into that vehicle, maybe had been communicating with that because that person backed up and opened the door and got in. The two women ran away. So this now looks like some sort of accomplice in this SUV. So the vehicle was disabled. Now you have another vehicle on the run with a murder suspect in the vehicle, possibly assisted by another person who pulled up. We saw them backing up. They may have been in communication on the phone, somehow trying to get in touch with them. We saw the door of the passenger side open. And so now we're going to possibly have one set of law enforcement going to try to get the two women. There were two women that we saw leaving. Uh, now you've got a suspect who has another vehicle and they are on the run. So this is a different kind of pursuit now. Instead of a disabled vehicle that we thought might be a chase that could soon come to an end, we now have another vehicle, high speeds here near the airport, trying to elude authorities, and this suspect now driving into oncoming traffic, going through an intersection there. We don't know if it was against that. I couldn't quite see that. But now you've got a very, very real problem here. Bruce, how does this change for law enforcement? It, if you're back to square one, you're chasing a healthy vehicle, which has not been spike stripped, does not have any disabling factors, and you're, you know, and you're basically chasing a new vehicle. So it, it's it's starting over. But now, do you do you treat the suspects in this vehicle differently? Because now you have somebody who backed up and picked up this person. So do your tactics change as far as trying to end this? Because now we've got a suspect who just blew through a stop sign, went into oncoming traffic, and the community is, is at high risk. Yeah, you are chasing a high-grade felony suspect who obviously has shown a wanton disregard for stopping, ending this, the safety of his life, the public, the police, everybody involved. So I would think if, if law enforcement gets a chance, they are probably going to try to do a pit maneuver on this vehicle as they did not see the suspect with any kind of rifle. Yeah, at that, po at that point, the person, we, we don't know if there was a handgun, but yeah, you're right. The person just ran and you could actually see that they were not taking a weapon. So now you see an aggressive move by one of law enforcement coming up quickly on the left of that uh, SUV. Uh, that person now weaving in and out of traffic. Again, this is near, this is at uh, La Brea and Arbor, and the suspect getting through that intersection. It is a green light, but navigating through that congestion, uh, and now, again, trying to elude authorities, and police are quickly back on this suspect, and we're coming through another green light, but turning on the right there, and going down onto La Brea. So again, back in the same general area, passing a, the, another little minivan there on the left into oncoming traffic and aggressively trying to get away. So it looked like that was an intersection of um, Tamarack and Kelso maybe, but it looks as if we're on Tamarack. So this suspect continues to blow through stop signs, which creates a real problem for anybody who might be driving that commute. Here at about 12.53, you see some people just out and about uh, so lunchtime folks who, you know, were spring break, there might be children out and about. Um, but this suspect has uh, really changed the dynamic of this chase. At first, we didn't know if this was maybe a carjacking and taking these two people uh, hostage or if they somehow were helping. But somehow this person into oncoming traffic now going around the vehicle that got stuck in the middle of the road into oncoming traffic here. We can't see ahead necessarily, but this is really incredibly dangerous. Now back into the proper lane. Uh, we're Manchester and South Prairie, and this suspect, high rate of speed, <coughs> but the driver is not the suspect. They are now. They're part of this now, but the person authorities were immediately looking for was the passenger of a Chevy truck. This vehicle, if you're just now joining us, backed up when the Chevy was disabled and got this person, picked up the suspect, and took him off. Uh, so we do have some word here that two suspects who bailed out earlier are now in custody. Uh, it says the driver carjacked a Mazda that they're still chasing. Uh, uh, the, the, the two women we saw running, that's important, out of the Chevy, they are in custody. Uh, we, they're called suspects in our, our note. I'm having a hard time believing that this is a carjacking of this Mazda 
it very possibly could be, I suppose. But Bruce, when we were watching, and I think you saw it as well, it looked to me like the Mazda backed up to pick up this person. Yeah, and so that's exactly what I saw when it was re-racked. Um, you know, but they are talking to those women and getting information, see if they are related or if they know this person. And they're going to sort through that pretty quickly. The good news is that you brought up the suspect in that vehicle is alone. There's not anybody else in that vehicle, which means law enforcement can be a little more aggressive. Okay, so now you've seen there on the right what Bruce and I were talking about. This person running directly up to that vehicle that backed up to them. Now, we, you know, our, our word here, some of our notes, they are calling it a carjacking. So I, I think to Bruce's point, there's so much to be sorted out here. The two people who are in custody are being called suspects, but they're also going to sort that out and find out were they allies or were they victims. This now is a very interesting case. This Mazda SUV that is on the run, aggressively driving, uh, and that is where the suspect jumped into the back seat of this vehicle when that vehicle had backed up and apparently had stopped to pick him up. Uh, but we're now seeing, going through stop signs, we're seeing law enforcement get right up on the back of this Mazda. So how they approach this is going to be a very interesting. A quick right turn here, now into either a side street or a parking lot. There you've got somebody with their lunch going into their car. That's what makes this so scary for the general public is that this could happen and be up on them so quickly here just going about their business. It looks as if we're... We're, we're parallel to Manchester. Is that what we're hearing? Or Yeah, alley parallel to Manchester. And now we're turning back on to Manchester in the opposite direction. So again, law enforcement right on the heels of this vehicle. And because they are in that area, Bruce, they could possibly throw another spike strip uh, it, it, with possibility because they've stayed in the general area, correct? That would give them a chance That's to do it. Yeah, that's correct, Philip. You know, re-racking that footage of his suspect getting in that vehicle, you don't see the driver get out. You see the passenger open, but no one ever exits. So we might be back to square one with a driver and a suspect in the vehicle. Oh, it's he definitely... Actually, there might even be more people, Bruce. If you look at the vehicle, he gets into the back. Now, watch the passenger side front open. So no one gets out there, and then the car drives away. So there could be two people in the front and one in the back. That's what I would surmise from what I just watched, unless somehow maybe the driver had reached across and possibly opened the door and pulled it back. So now you've got the wind. It looked like the passenger window is down. Either way, incredible what we watched in that moment because Bruce I have to admit I thought the chase was about to end right at that spot it looked as if the suspect was kind of pulling over and this was going to be a standoff and then he jumped out and ran straight to that vehicle again law enforcement is calling this a carjacking we have to wait and see how that develops but it does appear there could be at least two possibly three people in that vehicle and uh, driving into oncoming traffic again. So, Bruce, uh, I, I assume they would, again, we're, we're back to square one, except now we know that that suspect is not carrying a rifle with them. Right. And we are going to continually uh, go with the uh, fact of him being armed and dangerous mm -hmm. and, and being a murder suspect also. But, yeah, I think you're correct. I think there may be two or three people in that vehicle, possibly. Which, again, with the tinted windows in the back, you know, once it reaches its end point, that creates a, a piece of the puzzle for law enforcement when they're trying to secure the vehicle, trying to clear the vehicle, trying to know how, what, what they're facing. Uh, because you don't really... Uh, tell me the approach of, of law enforcement here, Bruce. You, you don't like the unknown when it comes to a standoff or engaging of, of a suspect. You like to know what you're facing. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, you want to control the situation, and you're controlling it, you're containing it, because you want to keep the unknowns from happening. However, the officers are going to have plan A, B, C, and D in this case when this finally ends. So I'm going to ask our producer as we're talking. I was just told they were, they were 
surmising two people in the car, but is that two people in addition to the suspect, or is that two people total? Because as Bruce and I were saying, it doesn't look as if it's two people total. It does appear... Okay, we're told that they are approaching this as two people in the car. Now you see another uh, move here to try to go through the traffic congestion, getting into the turn lane, going around. So we'll figure out the number of people in the car as we go forward. That seems an odd circumstance, Bruce, but I, I'm going to go with, with what they're saying on the scanner and what authorities are saying is possible. And again, they're calling this a carjacking, um, but from our perspective of it, 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 it was a strange sequence of events to watch the vehicle back up and somebody jump in uh, and, and, and very possibly the suspect, maybe, maybe the driver was trying to get out of the passenger side. Maybe that's what was happening, Bruce, and the person said, don't you dare get back in here and drive. But who knows, they're calling it carjacking and they're saying there are two people in the vehicle, but we'll say at least two people in the vehicle at this point. You see the vehicle once again, this Mazda SUV, once again still near the airport, still driving in the same general area. Uh, and did you see, wow, that was an aggressive move by law enforcement to jump up because it looked as he was, he was trying to make that right turn again. That might have taken him in the direction of the airport. So now look at this, up onto the median, in the center of the vehicle, up or on the, the road, up on the median, driving down the left turn lane. Here we make a left turn right there, nearly hitting that vehicle, getting control back in the left lane and making that right turn there. So whoever's driving is driving aggressively to try to get away. Uh, looks like they've now got into a parking structure of some sort. If that is the case, there he goes again. So they did, they pulled into that lot and then came right back out. I thought maybe might be going into a building underneath. Uh, but again, back on the road, trying to get away. And we again have high rates of speed here. And it, Again, if you're just joining us, we want to let you know this is a somewhat difficult chase to watch from Air 7 HD because of the flight restrictions that are happening near LAX. Here we go. Now we're into oncoming traffic. People have the right of way. This person driving through the red light, a person there in the sidewalk, in the crosswalk, stopping for all the authorities. And now that person is stuck as the light gets ready to turn green. Here goes the Mazda SUV trying to get away back uh, on regular uh, driving side back on the right side of the road, but showing a willingness to drive through congestion into oncoming traffic if necessary. And at one point up on the median that was dividing the two. Now that's interesting. Law enforcement getting on to oncoming traffic around the left turn lane to keep that person from going that direction. So Bruce, that's an example, it seems, of what you were talking about a moment ago. They are trying to get this person to go in a certain place. Yeah, that's what I think we're seeing is they are at, requesting additional resources from other stations, maybe even other agencies under mutual aid to get them, hey, block Manchester, block Florence, whatever street it may be, so we can kind of funnel this person into an area and deploy additional spike strips. And that's that's the thing. If they can get spike strips on it, again, you start to reduce the possibility that this might keep going. Uh, you can control the, the speed of this chase, which we've seen so many times, sadly, how this can end when the speeds get high and the suspect has a complete disregard for other people. So now uh, this person is still able to drive at high rates of speed, has shown a willingness to kind of force. Well, when it was the truck, when they were driving the truck, <clears throat> that truck plowed through traffic just bashed into and plowed through an intersection to be able to get to the spot where this carjacking occurred. So it was right before what you, right here is what you're watching. It, watch this. So the vehicle just plows through and it was shortly after this, we thought that maybe they might have a disabled vehicle and that, 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 that this would end. And then that's when the suspects jumped out of the vehicle and jumped, one of them jumped into this Mazda that we're looking at here, this SUV. There were two women that jumped out of the truck. They have been taken into custody, whether they're being questioned and uh, they are, we don't know their relationship to this person, but this person then jumped into this vehicle uh, and someone else is driving. So the murder suspect, we believe, is in the back seat of this vehicle. We did not see a rifle of any sort, but now the person is trying to navigate through and against the light and now into the turn lane trying to get around that box truck, which he has done effectively with the help of the box truck pulling over. So now you're back moving 
through pedestrian crossings, now going to have to pass the bus in the turn lane, uh, narrowing the streets here, much more congestion, uh, but again, near the airport. So this person has never really left this area, and that is why Bruce believes that they are able to get resources in place and possibly get a spike strip out in front of him. But Bruce, if he's continuing to go through the same area, he'll probably see that police presence begin to build as well, yeah? Yeah, that's correct. We saw that on a pursuit the other day on Channel 7 where they were just flooding the area with law enforcement and were able to close off intersections, funneling the suspect vehicle into an area that they wanted. Yeah, and if you funnel them into an area with, no, uh, with a cul-de-sac, or with some sort of industrial complex, that's going to be much better. But every time he goes through an intersection, it just puts so many people at risk because uh, this, there, this, is, this is a busy time of day out there. Uh, you've got a lot of folks driving around here at lunchtime. And so now you've got a guy willing to drive into oncoming traffic. Um, potentially carjack this vehicle, alleged carjacking. Um, it is possible. There, there you have another blocked intersection. Now on Manchester. So that's got to be an interesting thing in the vehicle. Uh, every intersection that goes by when you might want to turn one direction and you can't uh, because law enforcement's already there. Bruce, at what point uh, does, does the futility of this begin to set in? Oh, oh but no, go back here, seven. There was a U turn. They did a U-turn right there, uh, just behind, there it is. Now they did the U-turn, and here we are. Great, great, great camera work. So the, the suspect was able to do a U-turn, and you see them there now in the left lane. Again, driving up on to the median into oncoming traffic. There's a man carrying garbage out of the McDonald's, and here we are in this area. Now we've got another right turn into oncoming traffic. No, that's actually, I'm sorry, that is proper traffic side, but you you can see he was weaving wide, and I thought for a second there he was going to come across the lanes. So here we are on a street, looks like Main Street, coming up on 86th. So this suspect on a little bit of a street less traveled. So this, we don't know if this is an opportunity for a pit maneuver. We can't really see the speeds at this point. They look to be between 50 and 60 <coughs> miles an hour. Uh, but now into that left turn lane, and weaving a little bit. That might have been a spike strip. Bruce, is that probably what the suspect did, turned into the oncoming traffic? Okay, so they... Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think that's what they saw, and that's what the maneuver uh, caused. So they are getting to display spike strips in and around that area. And now you see going through a, a crosswalk there again, you start to wonder about schools and parks and areas of kids that are just out and about here on spring break. It's Good Friday. Uh, now you see possibly another maneuver to avoid, uh, but driving into the turn lane again at 98th Street and Main uh, into, uh, into the oncoming traffic lanes. Looks like there's some damage to the front of this vehicle too. Uh, so now we see on another side street and it looks as if, oh, that was gonna try to go down that, uh, that alleyway there. And so now we see trying to navigate a street that in many cases, you don't have room for two people to go by because it's you've got so many people parked on the road and it's usually an exchange of opportunity for traffic to and fro. Now we've got another quick right turn going down a street and it looks like they're approaching another main street here which is going to Century, that's Century, crossing Century and then no, making a left turn. And then now we're bound on Century, back onto one of the main streets there. Uh, and here we go again. But we've seen opportunity for law enforcement, and they have taken it to deploy spike strips here and there. At this point, uh, the person has been able to avoid that. Um, Bruce, I mean, again, we're still trying to figure out the relationship with the people in the vehicle. So they're probably going to gather that information as they can run the plates on this vehicle, yes? Oh, it looks. Have we lost Bruce? No, I'm sorry. I just I oh, lost you guys just for. Something. Okay, sorry, sorry about, that. about that. But but again, same same story as the first. You you run the plates on the Chevy to find out the connection. You're going to run the plates on this Mazda as well, correct? And find out if there's a relationship here. If this indeed is a carjacking, because that's what it's called. Correct. Also, you want to find out uh, where the registered owner address comes back to.
mm. which may be in the area that we are at. We're told that this is a female driver, which there were two women that got out of the Chevy. So if, if this is another carjacking, then he has carjacked another female uh, as, as he did before, or unless those were allies. And so now we are about to see what goes on with this one. Again, driving in the same general area, a murder suspect in pursuit or uh, uh, being pursued by LAPD coming up on a red light here, slowing down for this intersection, which is good. And, but here we go around the, the, the bus and then continuing on forward. So of course, uh, approach at least approaching the intersections with some caution, but still driving in the lane. Trying to see if that pr front passenger seat is a person in a white T-shirt, or if that may be something just laying uh, there. On you see some hand movements, some uh, gesturing by the person who's driving. Yep, it looks like there is a person in the front seat. And if I'm remembering correctly, the person who was on the run was wearing T-shirts. Yes, I can't remember if they were yep. wearing a white T-shirt. I remember they had dark hair, so maybe if we happen to see that as this vehicle got uh, hijack, carjacked, but you see some hand movements there by the person driving. Uh, you see this, someone in the front seat, and when we re-rack, we'll see exactly what the person was wearing and see if it's the same, uh, if the suspect has moved from the back. No. So, okay, we have a black-shirted T-shirt in the back. We have a white-shirt T-shirt in the front. With the, with the woman driving. So, Bruce, I'm back to thinking there are three people in this vehicle. Yeah, Philip, that's a, that's a great observation, and I would concur with that. As the suspect was wearing all black, he got in the rear. So you have a driver, a passenger, and then the rear passenger, the suspect. So I think that does kind of force law enforcement to be not as aggressive as a solo vehicle suspect well you also have a person on the phone so you have the driver who is said to be a woman on the phone and if perchance if mike and your <laughs> conjecture is true that somehow the person in black contacted this person and they picked him up then this person could be could be could potentially make a phone call for another exchange uh to let this person have another vehicle to get out of there because as we've all seen when you stay in the same community wow a, a person on a bicycle nearly hit by the mazda coming through there and there's a pedestrian right underneath air seven as this person is driving through so the the the, the general public is at risk with this driver uh, but we don't know what's going on with uh this chase uh we're this is being called a carjacking uh, but the front seat is occupied the driver is on the cell phone, and the murder suspect we saw jump into the vehicle is dressed in all black, and we believe they are in the back seat. So there could be three people in this vehicle. Uh, we are told by authorities it's only two. Now you see another turn uh, right in front of the vehicle, uh, but you see the damage to the hood. Uh, so, so, Bruce, I mean, you have to treat that as a possibility, right? That th we've, we've seen this person jump out and get into another vehicle. Um, the, now we see this, the driver on the phone. You have to assume that there's the possibility this might happen again. Yeah, yeah, Philip, you're 100% correct. Uh, the other thing, too, which might be happening, is maybe they're trying to negotiate a surrender. This could be a relative mm. who is in the murder suspect, and this could be a mom or an aunt or a sister who's saying, yeah, I, I'm, I'm in this vehicle. We want to stop, we want to surrender, but we want no harm to come to our relative. Okay, well now we're approaching the 105 freeway. Um, and at this point of the chase that we've watched, this person has not gotten onto a freeway. They've continued to drive surface streets near the airport. Okay, now the person appears to be off the phone. Um, both hands on the wheel that you can see there. Uh, but that could mean the cell phone was handed off to somebody else. Bruce, you make a great point. This could be a, hey, we want to surrender, but with, this is where we want to do it. And this is how we want to do it. It could be anything. Um, and it could also be, you know, hey, I want to help in this other way. We, don't, we just don't know. And that, that it's just an odd chase, Bruce, in that we thought it was almost over. 
Um, and usually, Bruce, when we see a carjacking, there is some manner of resistance by the person being carjacked. Here we go, into oncoming traffic, through another intersection, and back on the move again without hitting anything. That's good. But usually there's some manner of resistance, whether it's I opened the driver's side door and tried to get out or something. And that's what was unusual to me about this is that the only door that opened was the passenger door. The suspect jumped into the rear of this vehicle and without anything, the passenger side closed. We saw the two women running away from the Chevy truck. That's usually the behavior of somebody who is being carjacked is they just want out of that vehicle and they might run away. So it's very odd to me to have seen what we saw where there was no resistance at all from the people inside the vehicle. They stayed there. This person ran straight to the back seat, got it, didn't open the front door and try to pull the person out, jumped in the back and the passenger side door opened briefly and then shuts and nobody even made an attempt to get out of that vehicle as those two women ran straight by. Those two women have been uh, detained by authorities, and now we're looking at what authorities are calling a carjacking, but looked nothing like any carjacking we've ever witnessed here before. So now we see this Mazda going into the right shoulder, driving uh, across railroad tracks, uh, getting around any congestion in front. And again, here we go through an intersection, trying to make a decision to go right or left. Basically, it's just navigating those intersections. If I could have our producer say uh, what they said in the ear one more time. Okay, so that's Imperial and San Pedro is the road that we're on. So Imperial is the road, and that is, uh, you know, a, a pretty easy road to drive. So we're getting a really good look into uh, the, the driver who is navigating this, and we can see the white teat shirt person to her right. We cannot see into the back seat. Uh, that is where we believe the murder suspect jumped into the vehicle out after being run, after running away from the truck. Uh, so, Bruce, this is, at this point, kind of just another chase at this point. The officers are just trying to find a way to navigate them into where they can disable this vehicle, huh? Yeah, that's correct. You know, Imperial Highway is a multi-lane uh, east-west street, uh, mostly a commercial area. And as they continue further east, you're going to transverse into Sheriff's Territory, uh, Maywood PD, maybe Vernon. And, and, you know, I'd be curious to know where this suspect is wanted out of, meaning what jurisdictional area. But to your point, Philip, this is unlike any carjacking we've ever seen. Most people, like you said, would resist, maybe speed up, maybe try to get out of the way. But in this case, this vehicle backed up, and they let this person get into the rear seat with no objections. Well, we now have a flat tire, <clears throat> Bruce. We've got the rear back tire that has lost air. And you can see it there very clearly from Air 7 HD. Well, that was a little bit of a, a – we can, we can get a focus better on that one. But you could see it a moment ago very clearly – the, the back wheel is flat on the driver's side. Rear wheel is gone. So that means you're going to have the same type of thing that happened a moment ago in reverse. Um, the propulsion will be affected. But, uh, well, this might be a, a front wheel drive vehicle there, Bruce. I'm, I'm not. Uh, if Dave Coons were here, he could tell me. But in many cases, some of these are front wheel drive. So maybe it, it won't <clears throat> affect it as much. But either way, it'll affect control. Yeah? That's correct. You're also... Uh, sorry, you're dealing with a heavier tonnage vehicle, just like the pickup. It's a little larger SUV. Um, I do believe this is a rear-wheel drive vehicle. So as that tire disintegrates, the rim disintegrates, it's going to lock up, and that may cause some issues with it being propulsed, you know, being pushed forward. Well, authorities are going to... This is it, since it's fresh in our mind, I've got to think that authorities it, are not going to take for granted that it's been disabled. Uh, I would think that they will be very well prepared and uh, ready in the event that this vehicle does stop because it's happened once. We've seen the suspect jump out, run from one vehicle to another, and we've seen the driver of this vehicle on the phone. So now we're about to see how long this Mazda will be able to run with a disabled rear left tire. Just running a red light there, but it's, it's a little less dangerous at this speed, Bruce, because not only uh, is, is it you're not going through there so uh, with such surprising appearance, 
to oncoming traffic, but you have one, two, four, five, six, seven police cars. Uh, you've got to think the commuters know now uh, what's happening because lights and sirens in that neighborhood are going to be uh, resounding, and so they will probably see this coming. So here we've got a, a right turn, and they're now off of that. Uh, that was Imperial Highway, I believe. Uh, and now they've they've moved on to one of the side streets as well. It looks like uh, 87th Street is what, or in that neighborhood, that's what that street is. 88, so they're 88. So Air 7 is above 87th. That is on 88th. Uh, and so they are driving again. And in many of these uh, little areas, these little side streets we've seen, there are, there are speed bumps as well. So here we go. We have an officer in front. They've blocked traffic, and the person was able to go right on through. And we're seeing that more and more, Bruce. More and more often, we're seeing law enforcement at an intersection in front of them, and so that means they see it too. Yeah, what they're doing is they're letting, it's more of a public safety issue also to block the intersection to allow the suspect vehicle and the parade of police cars to get through safely, in addition to also funneling them into an area they want them to be at. And right now, the, the, when, one of the reasons they wanted to funnel him in a place is so they could get spike strips out. Uh, clearly, they, they, the suspect in this case avoided a couple, uh, but did not avoid all because one of them has flattened the rear tire. Uh, and so it, it might have even happened, Bruce, when, on one of those uh, efforts to avoid completely. I mean, that, it, that struck me as odd that it was able to disable the rear wheel, um, not the front, but it's possible, I suppose, that when he, she swerved to miss, that she didn't miss it on the back end, and that's what, that's what disabled that back tire. Does that happen frequently? Right. Yeah. Also, when you have a spike strip like this, there, it's a tack strip. It's actually three parts that will, as you throw it out. So you also have to retract it quick enough so you don't flatten the tires of the police vehicles in the pursuit. I, um, I actually had that once on a robbery suspect where I couldn't get it out of the way in time and a police vehicle rolled over it and got four flat tires. So it's, it's a real tricky maneuver. Well, we, we saw that in uh, that barricade situation uh, a couple of weeks ago where one of the officers uh, ran over it and disabled that vehicle when they had uh, called out um, SWAT special enforcement or, or, or uh, sheriff special enforcement and had the suspect with the tear gas. So that was... Uh, quite the day and then now we have this which is a very unusual situation we don't know the relationship of the people in the vehicle if it is a carjacking or if it was an assist um, we again were watching a chase we thought was nearly over when a Chevy truck had plowed through an intersection with basically no front wheel it was perpendicular to its way of travel uh, the wheel was about to fall off and collapse but they were able to plow through an intersection and get forward enough that when they pulled over they found a spot to stop the suspect and the other people in the vehicle jumped out at that point. This is on the right where we saw it. They jumped out and took off running. The two women run down the alley. The one man jumped into the back of this vehicle. Uh, and that's when the Mazda took off. We believe there are three people in that vehicle. Bruce Thomas and I believe that. Now we are seeing the suspect live drive through an intersection against the light. So that was an intersection that officers were not able to get to. Uh, they can't get to all of them, Bruce. Do they just decide we're going to pick one that we can throw a spike strip down so it doesn't affect uh, other traffic? And they just kind of, like you said, maneuver them to that place because they can't throw it down at every single intersection. No, you don't have those resources. It's kind of a hit and miss. It's like, OK, this guy is driving eastbound on, you know, Imperial Highway. Any units on Imperial Highway, uh, act up where you are. Maybe you're ahead. Maybe you're behind. And if you have a spike strip, maybe you can deploy it. But and everybody doesn't on carry one, huh? Too. No, that's correct. Uh, we just don't have the resources for that. Okay. So anyway, and again, another part of this is since this suspect stays in the general area, uh, officers are able to block intersections and maybe not throw down spike strips, but s certainly protect the general public as they can because of this particular driver who now goes through another intersection against 
the flow of traffic, uh, did not have the right of way, drove through that intersection on a flat tire. The best news of this pursuit, per se, is that this person is not able to go at the rates of speed they were going earlier. Uh, they've not gotten on freeways. They, hey, they have stayed uh, in the general area of 87th, Imperial, Century. There was one point with the Chevy truck that it, it looked as if this driver was going, or the other driver, was going to take this murder suspect into the terminal area of LAX, but they did a U-turn, went back to general direction, and we haven't seen that opportunity again. It, it did seem at one point that the suspect driving right now, the person driving right now, might have had that as an idea, but officers quickly closed, closed the gap and kept them from being able to get anywhere near the terminal. Now you see, again, that left rear tire starting to show some uh, further damage, really uh, not the smooth uh, finish that you would normally see on a tire, so clearly it's, it's, it loses its air slowly and it's lost it all. Now you're starting to see parts of the vehicle or something being thrown out of the vehicle. Uh, so now you have the, the, the passenger side window is cracked. We saw the driver's side window all the way down. Uh, this person now driving into the left turn lane to get around and then into back into its regular lanes, uh, splitting the two lanes here. Now you see vehicles in front starting to pull over smartly and get out of the way. But you have law enforcement, heavy, heavy LAPD presence right behind this vehicle. And uh, but we do have a high felony suspect, uh, murder suspect in that vehicle and they are not going to just back off and let this person go. So here we are into oncoming traffic. That person trying to make a left turn. There's a person using one of the scooters trying to cross the road with no idea what's happening. Uh, again, Bruce, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. When they go through there with a flattened tire, it makes it a lot safer for everybody. Yeah, it does because it decreases their speed. Um, you know, also as you get into these residential streets, some schools are still in session. Some only have half days, so the population is more out and about, which creates another issue for law enforcement with this pursuit. Yeah, certainly with Good Friday, a lot of schools, even if they are in session, will be out today. Uh, I, I, when I say that, I mean, maybe they were in session until yesterday. Now you've got, you know, and you've got kids there on the right waving uh, to the person who is uh, trying to, it is leading police on this chase, but again, you can take a look at that back rear tire and you see it is down. It is, it is completely flat. The front tires are okay, uh, but if this is a uh, rear wheel drive vehicle, it, it's going to be difficult to continue moving forward as soon as the rubber completely goes off of that, <laughs> off of that vehicle. Um, it, the, the steering of it, Bruce, will, will be a lot easier with, with the tires on the front, but you just, it, it, you'll start trying to accelerate and it'll just make the rim disintegrate that much faster on that rear wheel if it starts spinning on concrete if, once the metal gets to the, gets to the asphalt. Yeah, the spike strips are designed, they have like little mini, I'll call them straws for a better description. They embed, they break off and embed themselves into the tire and it slowly allows the tire to deflate and ultimately disintegrate like we've seen and then they're riding on rims. So it's also a safety issue that it doesn't deflate the tire right away, but it just takes time. Well, I noticed that the driver had her arm out the window. I couldn't tell if she was, got behind the tree. I couldn't tell if she was uh, dropping something. She, okay, so she did. We're told that she dropped the bag, and now again you'll see some hand movements there by the driver. Um, and so officers will stop and pick up whatever that bag was, and uh, they will look into that. So what would be, what would be anything that might help in that circumstance, Bruce, when they drop some bag out of the, out of the window? You know, maybe there's a wallet in there. Maybe there's an ID with a valid address on it. Maybe that gives the officers some idea of, well, you know, we're not going to where the registered owner is. We're going to maybe this person's address to wait there ultimately. And maybe they're in within this area that uh, the geographic area where the suspect's been driving. So the suspect, you know, Philip, yeah, I was just going to say, Philip, you know, as we've seen in these pursuits, there's no rhyme. There's no reason. And they just go on forever because the suspects don't know where to go. They feel trapped. 
Um, they don't want to just pull over and surrender. They want their last five minutes of freedom. Well, and this suspect has been now on the run for over an hour. Uh, this vehicle, probably 30 minutes or so. Um, so we, we've had two vehicles involved in one pursuit of a murder suspect. And as Bruce mentioned, they're feeling trapped. This person is feeling trapped not only because of the heavy police presence behind, but Bruce, if you're a murder suspect and you're, you're either out on bail or, or whatever, how will this affect your ability to get bail? I mean, you've now shown you are... It doesn't matter what the bail is. This person might get, yeah. be held in custody, and they're going to stay there until trial. Yeah, typically most murder suspects, and we'll go with this being a murder suspect, will have what's called a no bail, which basically means there's no amount of money you can throw at the problem to get bailed out. Um, you know, I think in these pursuits, law enforcement may have to be a little more aggressive. Um, you know, maybe force the hand, you know, try pit maneuvers uh, to say, hey, we're not going anywhere. So pull over. Let's end this thing. Come on. Yeah. And uh, as we look here, you can start to you see that rear tire really start to de disintegrate. Uh, 43rd and Hoover, it looks like now that <coughs> is probably Hoover. Is that or if, if anybody can uh, hear where that street is. Uh, but anyway, back back out on one of the main roads. But you saw those bumps. One more time. OK, we're going to this is the video of, of the pursuit here. You see, that's the weaving trying to get away. But we do think that might be where they uh, got the, the spike strip, at least into the rear tire. Uh, as Bruce said, just a slow, steady leak of air. And so now the person that is driving this vehicle has a and now you see the rubber starting to come off the back. Uh, if you look at the uh, rear wheel, on this vehicle, if we get a chance to, you'll see that the rubber is just starting to disintegrate now. Or, or no, it's the, it's the tailgate. It's, okay, the, the rubber is now damaging the bumper. So you can see that the bumper is about to come off because if you can imagine, the, 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 the tire is coming off in bits and it's, it's, some of it's still going to be attached and it's just going to be like a chain beating on the, 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 the bumper there and it's starting to cause damage to the back of that vehicle. And uh, can't really tell there how much is there but that's got to be unsettling Bruce inside the vehicle to start hearing oh, okay there's a lot of rubber that came off so now you have pretty much nothing on that rear tire if they did want to do a pit Bruce uh, it's a lot easier when the vehicle is disabled in this manner yes yeah that it is um, as parts of the vehicle start to disintegrate and fall off you're able to get more into the frame more into the wheel well more into the vehicle axle area, so the pit maneuvers become more effective. Mm -hmm. But you still see so many people coming out to see what's going on. You see kids there on the sidewalk walking along. Uh, it looks like that is a church. Uh, you see a lot of uh, vendors there on the sidewalks, and you just want you're wanting to pick the proper place if you do try that. Um, and of course. Part of this is that this is called a carjacking right now. So if uh, that person was on the phone, so if that person had called authorities, then maybe they know the relationship of all those involved. Maybe it is still a carjacking. It did not appear as if it was to us. That is what law enforcement is calling it. So we believe there are three people in this vehicle. Uh, they have refused to pull over, driven through multiple intersections come into oncoming traffic. We've seen this driver go up onto the median to try to avoid traffic. Now we see, again, driving into oncoming traffic in the left turn lane and now going through an intersection, breaking up a little bit. Can't tell if they had the green light, but they still went through without stopping. A little cautionary, but part of the caution is due to the instability of the vehicle. The driver cannot control this vehicle as if it were uh, a perfectly... Uh, Good car. Uh, that was that was a, a recharged car. Is that what you called it? What would you call it at the beginning, Bruce, when they jumped out of the disabled vehicle and jumped into this one? Uh, they had a new vehicle, oh. so to speak. Yeah, it was basically starting a pursuit from square one. Mm -hmm. You know, Philip, what's interesting is with the first vehicle, they stayed around the Westchester LAX area. With the second vehicle, they've gone further north toward the downtown area south of that. 
So that leads me to believe that this whole thing may have taken place in that area. There we go, Air 7. You got a little bit, a little bit ahead there. Uh, yeah, uh, and because, well, and here there's a stop sign. Yeah, uh, generally speaking, uh, in most of the chases we've done, the person likes to get into familiar space in the sense that maybe they think they can get out, run, hide, go to a place that they know. Um, so maybe this driver has moved into an area that the driver is familiar with, or it's possible that the suspect has forced them to go. But it's still, you know, it's still so risky for the community, and it, it, it's it's difficult. They speeding up a little bit. It's it's difficult to get them to stop uh, because of the danger to the community. You can't just pit when all of these com all these commuters are around. I mean, Bruce, a lot of people could get into an accident if this person is pitted in the wrong spot. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing, too, that, um, you know, they did studies on pursuits, and there are a lot of third-party uninvolved pursuit accidents, meaning it's not the police, it's not the suspect vehicle, it's people trying to get out of the way, people that are gawking at the, at the incidents, and they end up getting in accidents. So that's the last thing we as law enforcement want also. But also, to your point, the pit maneuver has to be done in a wide open operational area, meaning a multi-lane roadway, ideally with no cars parked on either side, no pedestrians, that kind of thing, in order to do a pit maneuver. Well, we've seen now the suspect here navigating through a space, and even though our signal was breaking up a little bit, we saw two pedestrians in the crosswalk crossing appropriately, and this suspect went around on the right, and they had to stop to avoid uh, getting hit by a car, which is that's the big worry that we have had throughout this whole chase because it's not been on the freeway. It's been on side streets and surface streets, and it's been on Century, and uh, it's been on Hoover, it's been on Imperial, uh, but it's the, the biggest worry beyond the worry for law enforcement because they are uh, chasing a murder suspect, which initially we thought they might have a, a rifle, but it's to the community um, because this person, oh, wow, that would have been a, that would have been a great place for one, Bruce. Uh, so just pulling off of Vermont, now you've got a couple more speed bumps in front. Um, so, so yeah, it has always been, uh, along with this chase, a danger to the community, Bruce, because it's just, there's just so many people out and about, and this person has been on these types of streets throughout. You know, and Philip, that is part of, a, of the pursuit policies of all departments. They have to give certain factors to the watch commander who ultimately makes the decision to end this pursuit, cancel it, or let it go. You know, one of the one of the conditions they ask for are, is road and traffic. What are the speeds? And they're you know, if the speeds get too high, it's not worth it. If the speeds in this case, which are more manageable, they're going to let the pursuit go. And the fact that you're chasing a murder suspect. Well, as we look at this street, Bruce, and with the presence of everyone, um, you know, it, it, is this indicative that they might be willing to just set step back and, and just follow until the car comes to a stop on their own? Because it did seem as if there were a couple of opportunities there where there were some open spots where they might try to pit this person. But they seem right now to be content to stand right, right behind and just let this thing play out. So does that tell us anything? You know, I think maybe law enforcement realizes this is not going to end in any way, shape, or form quickly. So we're just going to have to stay behind and let this play out, uh, whichever way it goes. Um, they're not going to disappear from the pursuit. It's not going to go into a tracking mode. Right. They can't because it's a murder suspect, you said. Yeah. Well, correct. You're looking at the, probably the highest grade felony that there is out there. Plus, in this case, they're chasing a carjacking suspect who is possibly still armed and dangerous, so they cannot allow this person to be out and about in the public. Yeah, this if if this is a carjacking, that could potentially be two carjackings because, you know, we, we don't know the relationship with the two women we saw get out of the truck, um, but if they weren't allies, they were carjacked likely. Um, so there's a, a litany of charges that are involved with the person who we saw jump into this Mazda uh, but there will also be what kind of charges are, are potentially facing anybody that might be assisting this person if, if per chance 
this was not a carjacking but an assist. Well, they become accomplices, and, and carjacking is a felony, so they become accomplices to that. Uh, aiding and abetting a felon in this case also. Um, you know, and any additional warrants or other open charges that they come up with relating to this pursuit. Well, we see, we see what's happening here now because the, this is a very, this is a slow speed chase now. We, all, we had a moment there where we lost behind the trees and it took quite some time before the vehicle came out from the other side. So uh, cautiously going over the speed bumps, uh, we, we don't know, but you can also see a lot of people coming out to take a look at things. You see just ahead here, there were people walking, and there's one there on near the sidewalk in the front yard. There are a couple of behind a, a tree. So you're seeing more and more people coming out to examine what's going on. Um, and the unknown of who the person was calling, where they might be bound, uh, this is... I'm not sure if maybe uh, can Air 7 not continue in that direction. OK, we're going to switch out helicopters as the person takes a quick left. We're going to quickly run to video if we can, and we'll show you kind of uh, what was happening earlier as this Mazda still with a disabled left rear wheel uh, is slowly still moving away from authorities, kind of picking up speed at this point. Um, so we're going to have to change our helicopters here a little bit, but this is what makes Bruce and I think it wasn't a carjacking. The fact that this suspect ran directly there, the two women kept running by, and, and it was almost as if the passenger side was opened, hey, you can get in. It was almost an invitation, <clears throat> Bruce, for people to get in that side, and they didn't. And that's when this person immediately drove away, and drove away without hesitation, Bruce. To me, that, that was also an indication that this person was involved because they drove away and they drove away with aggression. Yeah, you know, Philip, I'm, I'm going to use my my vast years of law enforcement experience and you're using your standard uh, issues of deduction. I don't think this was a carjacking. I think in this case, uh, law enforcement calls it that, but I don't think that's what transpired. Well, what we're watching as uh, this tape is before the vehicle uh, <clears throat> was disabled, uh, they were dry. This is the kind of aggressive driving Bruce and I were talking about uh, making a U-turn, driving into left turn lanes, running around that box truck. Look at this weaving in and out here. There were a couple of times where they almost hit and then maybe did hit. There is some damage to the vehicle. Uh, eventually, uh, this person was uh, I believe it was on Imperial. Uh, and Bruce had pointed out that when they, the, the spike strip went out and, and when the law enforcement pulls it back sometimes, uh, you know, the suspect tried to avoid it. Here it is. They tried to avoid a spike strip. But we think it's at that point that uh, in, in, when you pull that spike strip back so that law enforcement doesn't hit it, uh, it sometimes gets the back tire. And we think that maybe somehow along the way, it could have been, maybe, Bruce, are there officers on both sides of the road? Maybe they threw one from our right on the screen, and so that's how it got the back tire. But they, do they throw it from both sides or just one? Yeah, that's entirely possible. I mean, typically, if there is a medium, you're going obviously the vehicle's going to be on one side or the other. But in a wide-open street, they may have deployed two spike strips, forcing the suspect to at least run over one of them. And in this case, the spike strip may have gotten that rear uh, driver's side wheel. Well, if you look on the left side of your screen now, that is our second helicopter, Air 7 HD, <clears throat> is, is back with us as we uh, had to refuel one and uh, continue the pursuit. So you see, we're trying to find it again as we continue to look at some of the video there on the right. But we'll get Air 7 back up over this and we'll get an updated uh, look at where this is. But we've got to believe that it's not going to be long before this Mazda faces the same fate as the Chevy truck in that the rubber was pretty much off the wheel. So now we see law enforcement there live and we'll probably see the vehicle coming up here just any moment. But the fate is going to be the same because the rubber is gone from the rear wheel of the Mazda. So now you see them coming right into oncoming traffic. And the good news is that people have stopped at that intersection, but now They've made the turn and they are back on the road and you'll see the heavy police presence. Everybody will be smart enough to just stop at that intersection. Bruce has made mention of it and it's it's uh, it is 
to be noted that at this speed, it's a lot better uh, with the disabled vehicle because they're not going through those intersections as quickly and as, as dangerously uh, as they were earlier. Uh, but once we get over it, you'll be able to not have quite the obstruction from the, the buildings. But again, we have a murder suspect here and officers are not going to take back and just track this. They are going, Bruce says they are going to stay on this. And so, yeah, Bruce, we're, we're being told now he's in the back seat, but we kind of saw him be, we saw him back there and somebody's in the front seat with a white t-shirt. Yeah, you know, Philip, you know, looking at that footage again, it's almost like they were opening the front passenger door, maybe for those two women yeah. that were running by. Yeah, that's kind of what I was wondering. And then they just kept running. Um, but yeah, I think when we look at it one more time, that person in the passenger, passenger seat opens the door right there and then realized no. And again, that's conjecture. <clears throat> Bruce, we're not, this is, this is just, you know, you know, looking at video and this is not, they're not accused of the driver right now of the Mazda is considered, according to law enforcement, a carjacking um, it's a carjacking situation, but you know, you, that, that doesn't necessarily stop them from, you know, they, they have to approach this vehicle, uh, as if those might be allies, don't they? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm looking at the same thing you're looking at and it just doesn't have the issue of a carjacking situation. It may be, and they're going to treat it as that until they know for sure it's not. Um, but you're also going to treat everybody in that vehicle as a potential hostage also when the terminus of this pursuit happens. And so now we're actually able to see the vehicle driving there by the food for less with <clears throat> southbound western. And again, Bruce, as you mentioned, heading right back to the 105, kind of going back to the area uh, that they have been in, you know, I mean, they're further north, as you mentioned. They're moving a little further north uh, of the airport, but they've approached the 105 several times, just never have gotten on it. Yeah, they may be trying to go, you know, maybe this person really doesn't know where they're going, mm -hmm. and they're trying to get back to that Westchester area. Yeah, and so you could see that you could see the difficulty of that back wheel. I mean, it's, it's gone uh, for the most part, but... Uh, here we are at 147. You're watching Eyewitness News. We have broken into coverage of this pursuit, which has been going on since we've been covering it since about 1220. Um, there have been a couple of instances where the suspect, uh, whether in this vehicle or another, you know, ran into people. Uh, but this part of the chase began when the suspect, which is, we believe, currently in the back seat, a murder suspect currently in the back seat, um, jumped into this vehicle. Uh, after the Chevy truck that the suspect was in became disabled and uh, took off with whoever is in that vehicle. And as Bruce mentioned, you have to treat them as carjacking victims, but they will also be treated as potential allies. You see another person coming out, taking video there at the intersection. Not a wise thing to do, uh, but the speeds are such that... You know, you can you can see it coming. Um, but again, Bruce, this is everybody in the neighborhood is going to know this is happening because it's staying in the neighborhood. And I've got to think it's quite loud with uh, all law enforcement behind this person. Yeah, not just law enforcement, uh, but you have air law enforcement, you have media helicopters. So there's a whole package that's going along with this pursuit and people on social media. It's being put out. They know where it is. And they want to they want to participate. They want to see this. Wow. Obviously, we don't advise that for safety's sake, but it's human nature. So here we go now crossing the median in Gardena area and then back over. Um, and so now you have the suspect again driving into oncoming traffic. You see a couple of pickup trucks on the other side moving out of the way. Uh, Bruce, when I see a law enforcement officer follow the vehicle into oncoming traffic. Is that to maybe alert people ahead? Because maybe the lights and sirens are easier to see. Why? Or, or is, it, is it a tactic so they can, if they make a left turn, they can stay on them? Uh, why would officers uh, do that as well? It's multifold as you're touching on. One, whenever you're driving code three with lights and siren, you do have to obey the vehicle code. However, you are given latitude 
to be on the wrong side of the road when you can do so safely, as it does shield the officers from any kind of uh, fiduciary responsibilities. However, also, it is to let to keep the suspect within knowledge of we're right behind you. We're not going anywhere. What you're doing is maybe unsafe, and we're doing it as safely as we can, but it's also maybe to, as you said, alert oncoming traffic. Because you're going to see the lights flashing blue, flashing red, before you hear that siren. Mm -hmm. That's just the way sound works. So that's probably what they're doing also. Okay. Well, you saw uh, that this, I'm, I'm shocked that this person is able to continue maneuvering uh, as quickly as possible here, um, but there is no rubber on that back tire. There, you, you saw a, a law enforcement at another intersection that this person went through, so it is certainly possible that uh, there's, there's another spike strip <clears throat> coming up. I mean, that would, that would fully disable the vehicle. Um, I believe, did you say Marine? Okay, so we just went past Marine, uh, and officers again <clears throat> are right now seem to be letting this person drive as they will to not put pressure on the person to be any more unsafe than it has been uh, to this point. But uh, they're certainly still right behind. So now we're going into the left turn lane, uh, passing suspects, okay, pe people who are just <coughs> sitting there waiting on the on their lane. Now that's uh, Redondo Beach Boulevard passing on the right for somebody who wanted to turn right. Now back over into the left turn lane uh, to go through an intersection. So here we go, and it's dangerous in the sense that there's no rubber on the back tire. Now they'll be able to steer better, but they won't be able uh, to have their forward momentum as controlled as normal. But again, crossing Redondo there, uh, going around traffic, left turn lane, and then back over. Uh, so now switching back over and not going into that left turn thing. So it looks as if when they approach the intersections, Bruce, it's just they'll do whatever they need to do to get through the intersection and not have to stop. Yeah, that's correct. What we haven't seen are uh, some police vehicles trying to get ahead of this to deploy a spike strip. You're on a nice, even course of a street that uh, they seem to be going straight on. So I'm surprised we haven't seen that yet, but they may be coordinating that to get some additional spike strips down, maybe hoping that spike strip can lock up into the wheel well area and disable this vehicle quickly. Oh, when those, we saw that uh, recently when the spike strip just completely wrapped around the tire and there was just no way for the vehicle to go anymore. And that person tried, they tried to back up. That was the day of uh, um, the, the inhalants, uh, the nitrous oxide, and they just sat there for hours. But that, that vehicle wasn't going anywhere. And so here we are now with quite the different scenario, Bruce, the, the, the day that the person just sat there and continued to abuse the substance, uh, this person just is refusing to pull over and it is a murder suspect. And so that is a completely different animal. Now they have entered into torrents. So, so we'll, you know, each, each of these uh, areas will have different tactics, correct? And so, so, so LAPD is going to be in charge, I would assume. But when you go into torrents, now you have torrents PD that's going to help, yeah? Yeah, you know, all agencies are governed by, um, you know, a pursuit policy, a general policy issued by the state of California. Um, however, they do have uniqueness in their pursuits to allow certain other things. We've seen Orange County sheriffs actually ram the vehicle. Um, I know that's not something we do in our major law enforcement agencies. Uh, the pit maneuver is probably as aggressive as we'll get. But at some point, I think you do have to be a little more aggressive and end and these pursuits because they go on for hours. The drain on the resources and what we have seen multiple times, and I'm not bad-mouthing any agencies, but the information that they've been given has been faulty. Hmm. Well, and now you see more people out there as they see it approaching. Um, but, yeah, you know, when you talk about the drain on resources, uh, Bruce, I think that's one thing that people need to understand is that when you have this many officers... <laughs> Uh, tied up on one suspect, that delays potentially calls that are of life-saving uh, nature elsewhere because you're, you're having to go from a further distance to get to that call or maybe they're still getting the calls, correct? But it, it's just, 
at, at some point, you, you, you can't have this many people involved in one pursuit uh, and not affect the rest of the community. Yeah, that's correct. You're borrowing from Paul to pay Peter, in essence. In other words, if this was Southeast Division pursuit, well, how many cars do they have out there? Maybe oh, eight. So they're probably all involved. And now here we are going into that was southwest. That was yeah. that was bad. I didn't interrupt uh, there, Bruce. But uh, they're, now they're on the 190, and and then there was a into and, and here we are. When there's a desperation, when he starts to when she starts to accelerate here, and the vehicle has less control with that back tire gone, but into oncoming traffic. So there, there's. It's just it just gets to, you know, you, you start to think of people who are just, I, you know, innocently standing by here. And, and this is a busy part of town. It's a it's a difficult spot. And you've got this person. So crossing Van S now and in the left turn lane, but so far has not shown. OK, now now actually turning left. Usually the this driver uses the left turn lane to navigate around congestion and then get back on to the right of way. But now make it a left turn. And it looks as if we, we, I think, is that Van S that uh, we're now, yeah, southbound Van S near the refineries is what we're, yeah. And so there, there you are. So the, there are spots around here where you can actually drive around nicely. You see the LAPD airship above. Um, there might be spots here where you could get a shot at a pit maneuver because, Bruce, I think you make a great point that at some point it has to end. And, you know, they're getting more and more information the, fur the longer they follow. They're getting more and more information about the people in the vehicle. Um, and let's look there. Can't really tell what I'm. S oh, that's her hand. So that's just her arm on the wheel. Uh, so but we're learning more and more about whoever's in that car, basically by running the plates. We'll, they'll know who the murder suspect is. And by running the plates, they'll know probably who the driver is and how the how or if they're connected. Right. At this point, yeah, they've got information. Through, yeah, and even through reverse directories, they may even be calling the cell phone hmm. holder and saying, okay, hey, look it, let, let's end this, pull over. No one, we're not going to hurt anybody. We'll take you into custody as safely as everybody wants to be taken, and let's just end this. You're not getting away. But to your point, when around the refineries down where they are, those are wider streets, more commercial, more void of pedestrians and other hazards. So it's almost a perfect space to do a pit maneuver. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe I was told this they're on Delamo now. So, uh, but here, here's the thing: driving in the turn lane, um, driving right in the turn lane when it doesn't seem to be necessary, uh, because you have space there and now back back into to the regular lane. But maybe <clears throat> this road is a bit more difficult with a pit because you have all of the innocent you know just the, the random cars parked there on the side you don't want to cause property damage but now we're turning right uh we're able to stay in the lane that they were supposed to be on we'll get a, a street for you here in just a second <clears throat> but um the person the suspect or the driver here um not at high rates of speed so this is western delamo this is west on Delamo. Um, so if you happen to be down near Torrance, you're going to, to see a heavy police presence. If not, okay, we're southbound Western. We were on Delamo, turned south on Western. But uh, not just for the immediate pursuit. It, you will see in the neighborhood uh, officers who might be blocking the roads, might be in front of this vehicle. Uh, so if you're anywhere in that area, they're going, there's going to be a heavy police presence and, and you'll be aware of it. But we've been following this now for a couple of hours. Uh, or yeah, we're, we're coming up on an hour and a half, it seems, entering an intersection here. And that is a red light. And they are going through Torrance Boulevard against the red. And everybody there seemed to see what was going on. So that's good news. It, it, it seems as if they're enough ahead of this that they're able to, to stop traffic and, and let people know to not drive into these intersections because this person is not stopping. Um, but this began uh, with a Chevy truck with a murder suspect. You're watching Eyewitness News, uh, by the way. Um, it, this is a special coverage of uh, this car chase that has been ongoing now for about an hour and a half. Uh, so we thank you for uh, letting us interrupt programming to let you know what's going on here. Uh, but this is a murder suspect who is putting the community at great risk. Now we're entering an intersection here with traffic that has not been stopped. 
So that's Carson and through the intersection, two people in a crosswalk with no idea what they're looking at and uh, about six or seven B LAPD cars right behind this person. And so they have continued to uh, elude authorities and drive erratically, certainly into oncoming traffic when necessary. Approaching another intersection here, it looks like they have the right of way now, or at least the vehicles stopped. So we're seeing, for the most part, uh, <clears throat> people involved in this pulling over. We haven't seen anybody really uh, stubbornly refuse to, to get out of the way <coughs> or try to get involved. Uh, now a left turn here. S okay, the, the, but this is a different part of town, Bruce. This is not a part of town that they have been, they haven't been in Torrance. Uh, they, they were in, uh, they, they were in the Westchester area. They were in, uh, down, near downtown. They're in Harbor Gateway now. So technically this is Harbor Gateway. So again, maybe they drove to an area that they wanted to get to, uh, but they might just be an unfamiliar area. And that, that's good news for law enforcement when they're not in familiar area, right? Uh, that is because they're not trying to go into an area where there are friendlies or relatives that may interfere with the end of this pursuit. Um, you know, you do have other agencies like Torrance, maybe Redondo Beach, Manhattan Beach that are on, on standby for this just in the odd chance that the pursuit does transverse into their area. And Torrance PD is actually a very aggressive agency. So at some point, you know, LAPD, they're not going to relinquish control of this pursuit, but I'm sure they're getting a drain on their resources to that point. Somebody was trying to talk in my ear, Bruce, and I, I, I think... They're, okay, they're heading towards Carson now, so I'm sorry I, I missed the, the last of what you were saying there, but, uh, you know, we continue to follow this. Uh, we are now at 2.01, and we are interrupting programming. We will, of course, let you know when General Hospital will air in its entirety. Um, we're following this due to the danger to the community um, because there is a murder suspect in the back of this vehicle. There are probably three people in this vehicle. We've confirmed through LAPD that there are two, but uh, it does appear as if we've seen three. Um, in a previous vehicle that this uh, suspect was in, uh, we saw three people, two women. They have been detained by authorities as they try to determine how those people were involved in the initial chase. Uh, but the suspect here is, uh, they were on 223rd, and now they're in Carson heading on Vermont. So Vermont is a familiar road that we've been dealing with uh, so far, Bruce. So maybe we're south, they're southbound. So now maybe we're kind of beginning to move back into areas of familiarity for the driver. Yeah, they may be heading back north to get back over into that Westchester area or maybe even the area south of downtown. Um, but I think LAPD is definitely weighing the opportunities to do a pit maneuver and end this pursuit. The, we're getting word maybe they might be heading in the direction of Long Beach. Sometimes it's just it's difficult to, to see, but they're on Vermont. And so now you see that person trying to move out of the way very, very slow now. Very have, have really gotten a lot slower here. Um, the, the, the speed is going to be affected by the inability of anything on that back. So now we have a person getting out. This is so dangerous. The person is out. The vehicle is now not being checked. So that is, so Bruce, there were two people in. He was wearing a white T-shirt. That's the suspect that we saw. So he's taken off. One person is running away. This person is now on the run. That is, we believe, the murder suspect who initially got into uh, that Mazda, and he had jumped somehow into the front seat. He is running from authorities down the sidewalk. Uh, they will be able to know where he is. Okay, now he's got his... He's got his hands up, but still running. So let's see what ends up happening here. He is running out of gas, it seems, uh, in this circumstance, getting exhausted. He's coming up to someone's house. Now, this is a potentially dangerous situation. If he can get into that house, they have two men in front who have moved out of the way. So officers are now uh, trying to get the suspect to get on the ground. These two people have walked away. The suspect is, looks to be in front of the garage behind those two vehicles there. They're trying to get him away from that, I would assume, Bruce. And it looks as if he is he's refusing to obey a command. He is certainly not getting down on the ground. You can see his hands up.
but he is not doing what they say at this point. You see less than lethal there in the man's hand in the back. It looks like or could be a green weapon there uh, now. So some of the officers do have <coughs> guns trained on this person, but he's not turning around. Bruce, he, should he be on the ground now or turned around? What do you think the, the officers are trying to get him to do? You know, they're probably trying to get him to lay on the ground. So at that point, they can produce with, um, proceed rather, with taking him into custody with some control, pain compliance holds, a knee okay. in the small of the back, grabbing a hand, putting it behind his back to handcuff. And that is what they've done. So he did go and uh, finally comply, and he is in custody now. So, that, so it does appear, uh, after our conjecture that there might be three people in the vehicle, that it does appear if it's, there were two. So he was wearing a black sweater, and we were seeing his white T-shirt in the front seat. Uh, we did see a woman get out of the vehicle, and she ran away um, while the vehicle was moving, which, of course, brings back uh, horrible thoughts of the incident a couple of weeks ago where the person got out of the vehicle at about 50 miles an hour and uh, deceased. So this woman was able to get out of the vehicle. You see now they're going to try to clear the rest of the vehicle and make sure no one else is in it. The car did come to a stop there on the center median. Vehicles are still able to get around. Uh, we're just going to stay with this just for a second to make sure that they can clear the vehicle. So two people were apparently in that vehicle, as is what uh, authorities had said. So we thought that somehow uh, the, there was another person in the vehicle, but it wasn't. <clears throat> there were two in there. One ran away, and we do believe that person was probably taken into custody by authorities. They jumped out of the car while it was moving, uh, both the driver and the person we believe who was a murder suspect. So uh, at 2.06 now, I believe we'll probably wrap this up. So we're going to wrap this up and let you watch General Hospital. You see that the murder suspect is in custody. They will sort through all of the charges this person faces and any potential charges that might face the driver of the Mazda and the two people that were in the Chevy truck. So make sure you're with us for Eyewitness News at 3 o'clock. We'll give you details on all of that. I'm Philip Palmer. Thanks for watching.